Welcome back. What rose out of the water next wasn't Kurokami. A little warning this week, there's several pieces of heavy machinery right beneath my window that are very loud. They seem to be digging up the entire footpath and then drilling to the middle of the earth. So if there's a lot of sound feedback in this one, I'm sorry. I cannot do anything about it and this is the only time I have to record. This picture is really gross. Clicking the button. It was a doll, one I recognized. The Japanese doll Kurokami always carried when f was floating there in the tub. Once again, well said. The blob didn't seem pleased by it. It groaned with discontent as it scooped up the doll and turned it around and around, studying it from every angle. That was probably my one and only chance. With the blob's attention off of me, this was my first and last opportunity to escape. But my legs wouldn't move. They crumpled beneath me, as though I were a marionette. Of course, that blob was only playing with dolls. So even I was its doll too. Without even realising it, my body from the neck down had become a ball-jointed doll, just like Kurokami. The blob lurched menacingly towards me. It then lifted me up, placed me between its folds. Ah, oh, that's gross. And smothered me against it. Thank you for that visual. The feeling of its curly hairs against me, that's gross, its revolting odour and heat, and its sewer-like breath filled my throat with bile. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, you. The blob touched my ball joints. <laughs> lovingly twisted them. Hello? Anyone? <laughs> Why am I being made to read this? From time to time, I felt them bend in ways they shouldn't with a crack. Ah, guh, ga. Though barely conscious, I could feel my joints bend and break into various directions, one after another. Finally, they all broke, leaving me nothing more than a head. What he said. The blob embraced my head and licked it with the gooey substance oozing out of its rotten breath. I mean, if they wanted to gross me out, they've succeeded. The stench was beyond repulsive. I felt like I was going to suffocate from all the nausea. Soon enough, the blob, 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 engulfed my head. Gah. Snap. Well, thanks for that. That sure was a thing. I slowly sat up in the dimly lit bathroom. It was dark around me. Apparently, it was nighttime. How long had I been lying there? Pant, pant. Phew. I felt like I'd just been in the throes of a horrible dream. I exhaled heavily, as if to drive out something disgusting that had built up in my lungs. You please don't tell me the blob is in his lungs. I could tell I had an awful nightmare, but couldn't remember anything specific about it. That's just how it is. Nightmares are vivid when you have them, but vanish with barely a trace once you wake up. As someone who consistently has nightmares and has had nightmares my entire life, that's a lie. I remember them when I wake up. It's very unfortunate. Why is his voice so quiet? I can't hear anything. Why was I sleeping here? Maybe I'd been anemic and passed out. Mm, yes, that happens all the time. I had no clue. The clearer my head got, the more I realized worrying about it wouldn't accomplish anything. I shook my head and opened the door to the tub to start a bath. Traces of warmth lingered still. Ew. But there was no way anyone was there. My elbows and knees had been hurting ever since I woke up. I checked my elbows in the mirror to find them a little red and swollen. That night, I had the strangest dream. Not again. Okay, this is better. It was of Kurokami, sitting alone in a world of falling black snow. That picture is very, very gorgeous. I love the white kimono. The black snow landed on the shoulders of her white robes, staining her in a monochrome gradation. She looked lonely 
So I tried approaching her, but no matter how much I walked, she didn't get any closer. A firm and cool transparent wall was separating us. Firm and cool transparent wall. Hmm. At the very least, I wanted to tell her she wasn't alone. I kept pounding on the wall and shouting at the top of my lungs, but she didn't hear me at all. Upon closer inspection, I realized tears were streaming down Kurokami's face. The black snow sullied her tear-stained cheeks, making it look as though she were crying lines of black. It's just her mascara. She was facing my direction, but it didn't seem she could see me. Perhaps the wall was only transparent on my side. If that were true, then she was all by herself within the wall, the black snow burying her whole. My heart ached at the sight of her tears. Was it pity? Sympathy? No, it was a sense of duty, no question about it. A baseless sense of responsibility telling me I had to save her. If I didn't, she'd be left alone in that world, doomed to be buried and fade away under the black snow, all the while shedding tears stained black by the soot. Lovely artwork. Even after I woke up, I just stared blankly at the ceiling for a while. This was the first time I'd ever remembered a dream so clearly. I cannot hear him at all. Why? Why can't I get Kurokami out of my mind? I mean, it beats thinking about your cousin. That's all I'm gonna say. I couldn't understand my own feelings. I wondered if maybe I was in love with her, but that definitely wasn't the case. I was an adolescent boy just like the rest. I knew the bittersweet taste of unrequited love. True, the fact that I couldn't get her out of my head was similar to that. But this was different, I just knew I had to help her. And there was no time left, not even a second. And she said it was too late. Even so, I had to help her. Why? I didn't know. But that emotion was filling my heart. And telling me I had to act as soon as possible. So much banging. That peculiar feeling stuck with me even after Kiko invited me to go to school with her. I still couldn't get Kurokami out of my head, even after we got there. Kitagami-san! Kitagami-san! Here! Kinugasa-san! Here! Kurokami-san! Oh, that's right, Kurokami called in absent today. It wasn't rare for Kurokami to be late for, or, or even miss, homeroom. But even so, she still went to school every day. At the very least, this was the first time anyone had called in to say she'd be absent beforehand. That's odd. Kurokami's never absent. Who cares? Not like she studies anyway. Don't say that, Atsuta. Suzumu's totally hung up on her. Is there something wrong with that? Did you find some hidden appeal in such a scary girl? Great! Way to go, Susahara. You really are a great man. Do whatever you want. Just don't come crying to me later. Oof. Jealousy is not a good look on you, Harumiya. Yeah, mess him up. Stay out of this, Atsuta! Is getting involved with Kurokami really so wrong? <laughs> I don't care. You do you. <laughs> you tell him. <laughs> I'm sure something really, really bad's gonna happen soon, though. Just go and get cursed for all I care. 
What? It's okay, I make sure to do my spiritual cleansing every day. That's totally normal. Hey, Suzumu, what happened to your elbow? I was getting a little sweaty, so I rolled up my sleeves. Kiko must have noticed my swollen elbow. I don't know, maybe I slept on it funny. Does it hurt? It does when you touch it, so could you stop? It looks like your other elbow is the same way. My joints have been hurting ever since last night for some reason. It's a curse. You're blowing things out of proportion. You caught Kurokami's curse. Don't say I didn't tell you so if it gets worse, you hear? Don't worry. I'll go see a doctor if it still hurts after school. <laughs> You're better off finding an exorcist if you ask me. Kiko was dead set in her belief Kurokami was a cursed being. I guessed it was just because girls have a thing for the occult. Probably. And if all the girls believe that, none of them would help Kurokami. So it really was all up to me. That strange sense of urgency was still plaguing me, even at school. He really does have a hero complex, doesn't he? I once again wondered if I was in love with her. And yet again, I came to the conclusion it was a sense of duty instead. But why? Why did I feel this way for a girl I'd never met before? Was it obligation? Responsibility? Sympathy? Pity? No matter how many times I retraced the source of, of my emotion, it always came back to that baseless sense of duty. Even after lunch break had come and gone, I was still captive to that emotion. The hell? Toei's taken the day off? That worthless bee? Ugh. Uh oh, is he cursed? You're not looking so good, bro. <laughs> hey, Sho, you okay, man? I don't think he's okay. Sho kept hacking and coughing as though he were choking on his own spit. His buddies kept rubbing his back with wry grins until he finally calmed down. Sho wiped his forehead to find beads of sweat. He must have really had it rough. I've been feeling like shit since I woke up. Like I got allergies or something. Yes, indeed. Maybe it's pollen. They say there's lots of it going around this season. Hell if I know, go ask the pull. <coughs> Sho spat in disgust and coughed up phlegm. Ugh, this really is the gross out novel, isn't it? What the hell is this? You. Holy shit, man, what is that stuff? It's all black. What Sho had coughed up was neither yellow nor white. Do we have to? It was black as tar. It was the first time he'd ever coughed up something like that. I'd hope so. <laughs> it would be a bit worrying if he did that on the regular. Shocked, he spat again to see if more of that colour came up. But what came out this time was the same colourless spit as always. God damn it, the F is that. It's gross. He stomped furiously. <laughs> Why? Why would you step on it? He stomped furiously on it. Now it's going to be all over your shoes. Ugh. Ugh. And why the hell have I been feeling like crap all day anyway? This, this, this guy just swears way too much for me to be reading it all. 
Is it just a cough or do you have a fever? Sure you're okay? I'm feeling all kinds of exhausted now. Yeah, this might be worse than I thought. <laughs> that creepy chick must have cursed you when she licked your foot. Deserved. The delinquents laughed crudely. But Shou heard none of it. He was feeling terrible at the moment. Want to tell the teacher and go home? Hell, I just want to lie down. Cough, cough, gah, cough. Eloquent. It seems you have a slight fever. Bull, my normal temperature is just lo- cough. Yes, ma'am. Why don't you lie down and let me take a look at you? You're in 2C, right? I'll let your teacher know. Man, F this cough to hell. Ugh. Indeed. Hinagata shut the curtain once she saw Sho get into bed. Oh gosh, those chairs. I had that exact chair at one of my schools and that exact desk as well. <laughs> Once his coughing subsided slightly, Sho took his hand off his mouth and found his palm stained black. God damn it, what the hell? Though the infirmary bed wasn't all that comfortable, Sho drifted off to sleep as though his consciousness had been swallowed whole. My knees and elbows were still swollen and throbbing even after school, so I decided to play it safe and go to the hospital. Good idea. Iwaimoto Hospital for Medicine and Surgery, located just past the Iwaimoto Shopping District, was grander than I had pictured. Iwaimoto was the name of the neighborhood I lived in. Iwai meant celebration, and seeing it around on signs always brightened my day. So, although hospitals aren't always the happiest of places, Iwaimoto Hospital seemed friendly to me. The hospital was full of the elderly, just like the one where I used to live. I felt a bit guilty for going there for something as trivial as swollen joints. Those more visibly in pain deserve to be here way more than me. Right, just like that g- <gasps> Nani? That black-haired girl. It was Kurokami. No mistaking it. She was in a wheelchair, with the same doll riding on her lap. But seeing her with her left arm hanging from a sling and her right leg in a cast, it hurt to watch. It wasn't just those either. Her other limbs were wrapped up in bandages too. For some reason, I could sense her knees and elbows hurt just like mine. I faintly remembered the world of the nightmare I'd had when I collapsed in the bathroom. Just like me, her joints were snapped by that grotesque blob. Kurokami-san. You shouldn't get involved with Kurokami. I felt like I heard Kiko's voice amidst the crowd. Bad things will happen if you get close to her, I just know it. She'd been giving me that warning over and over again. What was happen- Was what happened to me one of those bad things? I read that entirely the wrong way. Kurokami and I were classmates, so it was inevitable we'd meet in the classroom. But if I struck up a conversation with her here, I'd clearly be approaching her proactively. <laughs> Bad things will happen if you get close to her, I just know it. Yeah, we just said that. Of course Kiko wasn't there, but it felt like she was giving me my final warning. 
If I just kept standing around, she'd probably disappear into the crowd. I still had a chance to stay on this side. Wait, this side? I asked myself exactly what those words that had popped into my head meant. Just as Kiko had a sixth sense, so did I. It warned me that if I talked to Kurokami now, there'd be no turning back. Too late for that. She'd already caught my heart. I couldn't turn back anymore. Our destinies were intertwined from the first moment I looked into her eyes. A part of me wanted to save her, while another part of me wanted to know why I started feeling that way. And the latter was the biggest reason why I couldn't get her out of my mind. Kurokami, just who was she? I wanted to know, and then ask her a question. Who are you, and why do I feel this way about you? I already knew it wasn't something as simple as love. Then, was it something sinister, just as the rumours said? Have your eyes cursed me? Is that why I can't take mine off you? In the end, I acted before I could come to an answer. She looked somewhat surprised to see me. I'd never seen such a natural reaction from her at school before. That looks bad. Are you okay? She was expressionless as always, but not in the same way as at school. She was obviously surprised to bump into me here, of all places. Move. Who are you? Do you go to Susuhai? The middle-aged man pushing her wheelchair scowled at me. He was probably her father. Yes, I'm in the same class as. I don't want you talking to Toe unless you have to. Huh? I'm sorry, but she's too important to be corrupted by the filth of the world. Probably a little late for that, considering the feet she's been licking. I let her go to school because I want her to live like others her age, but I can't allow her to be corrupted. So he's using the word kegare, which you can probably hear, which is like mostly used in like Shinto terms of like unholy corruption or filth. I couldn't think of anything to say to that. It was the first time anyone had said something like that to me, and I didn't know whether to be angry or hurt. You're always... Late. <laughs> Go away. Your corruption hurts. Toe, don't push yourself. Yes, father. My apologies, young man. I shouldn't have been so harsh with you. No, I'm the one who's sorry. You have nothing to apologize for. If you're concerned about Toe, then please, just watch over her from a distance. But... Something's tormenting her. I wanted to say that, but her father stopped me before I could. I don't want you talking to Toe again. Even if you hold no ill intent, all that will bring her is suffering. Normally someone my age would have no choice but to back down without a word after being told off like that by an adult. However, there was something in me that just couldn't accept that. So I stood my ground. But... She's suffering. I can't just ignore her now that I've realized that. Toe's father fell silent. That was a sign he was aware of her torment. 
世俗の汚れから遠ざける必要があるならばどうして亀沼君を言い名付けなどに選んだんですか If she needs to be kept away from the filth of the world, then why did you choose Kame Numa as her fiance? That's a very good question. That's none of your concern. I just can't believe she could ever want to be with him. You're too late. Those words replayed in my mind once more. Perhaps she'd meant she'd been forced to bear this fate because no one had noticed her suffering sooner. I wasn't sure about that, but there was no doubt that she was suffering greatly. There was no way she could be happy, being treated like a pet by a fiance she didn't even love. If the rumors Natsu told me were true, yesterday was hardly the first time Kamenuma had been so rough with her. Just by looking at her and her father, it was easy to imagine she was from a strict family where she was in no position to oppose him. <laughs> It's up to me to decide who Toe marries. It's none of your concern. Oh! No. It's none of yours either. You tell him. Nani? Her life is hers to decide. I understand she's a minor. You should indeed. She should indeed be living under your care. But once she comes of age, her future is her own. You may be her father, but you don't have the right to keep her completely tied down. It seemed Toe's father hadn't expected a child his daughter's age to talk back to him like that. He appeared more stunned than angry. Kurokami, maybe everything I'm saying is completely off the mark. But I know you're suffering, and you think it's too late to do anything about it. And there's one thing I can say for sure. What? It's never too late. I don't know if I can be of any help to you. But I'll always be on your side. Count on that, if nothing else. Mr. Kurokami, I apologize for speaking out of turn. Pardon me then. I hope you'll get well soon, Kurokami. Just. Go already. Kurokami hung her head, biting her bottom lip. I didn't know what she was feeling, but my words had definitely gotten to her. And I believed that would save her, or at least serve as the spark of her salvation. I don't want to say another word to you. Move out of the way. Right. Sorry. Let's go, Toe. Yes. Toe's father gently pushed the wheelchair past me, only for his daughter to look back at me in that very moment. Her eyes were damp with tears. She reached her trembling right hand out to me. The look in her moist eyes implored me to at least take her hand. Moist. And so I did. I wanted to grant her wish and I didn't need words to do so. You shouldn't get involved with Kurokami, Suzumu. Why shouldn't I, Kiko? She needs help, so why shouldn't I? The moment our hands touched, 
time itself seemed to grind to a halt. The world was frozen in place, almost like the TV known as Life had suddenly broken. But the girl before me was real, and so was the warmth of her hand. In fact, this world seemed more like reality. After all, her eyes actually had life to them here. Enough to make me question if the days up until now had all been a daydream. That's just how vivid they were. Kurokami shed warm tears and spoke. Her words were clear and had a deliberate weight to them. Thank you, Susuhara. No, I should be thanking you. I'm glad you opened your heart to me. I couldn't, because I couldn't afford to open it. Oh, Kurokami stood up, staggered on her cast and cased foot. That's one way of describing it. She walked over to me until our chests were practically touching. How? Her arm is in the way. And looked up at me. This is your fault. Because you told me I could cry. Yes. So you heard that, huh? I hadn't said it aloud, but it had reached her. I... I'm going to cry now. Okay. <laughs> Understood. You don't have to understand. Just stand there and let me cry, alright? Okay. With that word, she gently plunged into my arms. Hmm. I can't say I've ever heard of anyone plunging that way, but... And as she softly clawed at my chest, as you do, she burst into tears. I said nothing and let her sob. <laughs> You're late. You're too late. Okay, they're starting the tractors outside. And we've just about hit the time limit for this episode anyway, so I'm going to end this one here while they're just roaring outside beneath this window. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Come back next week and let's find out what's going on with these two. I'll see you guys then. See ya.